Hello, and welcome to Chapter 4's lecture on democracies and democratization. Um, this is uh, going to be covering some of the main tenets of democracies. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into this. My sort of um, way of doing this, as all of you know by now, is to split the chapters into two lectures, Part 1 and Part 2. And so let's see if we can't get through... Um, I think I have roughly, I don't know what it is, about 14 or so slides um, to make our way through on this first part of Chapter 4's lecture, and then uh, stay tuned for Part 2. So, uh, what is democracy? This is a common question that we might ask ourselves when we're thinking about this particular topic. Um, we should really kind of um, go back to the origin of the term. Um, demos, the common people. Um, when we're defining democracy, it might serve us well uh, to go to the origins of the word. In the original Greek, demos referring to the common people that I just mentioned, krata, meaning uh, power or rule. Taken literally, democracy is a system in which political power resides with the people. In the modern era, democracy takes many forms, but all democracies have a few uh, core things that are in common. These regimes all include public participation, political competition, and liberty as core features. Liberty meaning limits on power, um, some of our civil liberties certainly uh, outline uh, within democracies what the government cannot do to the people, um, that sort of thing. And that's what I am trying to get at there. Um, sort of, we can th also consider or think about political power being exercised either directly or indirectly by the people. California as a state, right? If we just think about our own context here, for a moment um, has some of the major core uh, elements of a direct democracy. We have the recall um, for the governor. If we don't believe that the governor in the state of California is doing a very good job, the citizens of this state have uh, an obligation to throw that person out of office, gaining, you know, going through the political process in order to do so. Gavin Newsom had a recall. He beat that. Uh, a former governor, uh, Gray Davis, who did not beat the recall, was not as successful as Gavin Newsom. Um, Gray Davis, also a Democrat, was recalled and Arnold Schwarzenegger stepped in as governor, a, a Republican, a moderate Republican uh, at, at that as well. So anyways, the recall is one thing to highlight, a referenda and um you know, the initiative. Um, you might see people gathering signatures for initiatives put on the ballot so that the people can in this state of California can go and vote on those initiatives. So we have a lot of different things for uh, citizens of California and, and the United States to kind of keep track of, keep, keep their finger on the political pulse of what's taking place in their state and the national government. Of course, we have that representative democracy at the national level where we send um, our reps, our House members, and our state senators, uh, our U.S. senators, I should say, uh, to go and make decisions for us. So anyways, um, I'm just trying to, try to throw out some examples that might be helpful for students uh, on this overhead. So let's look at um, how, do we, how do we look at like sort of good and bad democracies. Um, illiberal democracy and liberal democracy. There are some differences here that we need to discuss and go through. Many non-democratic countries, such as Russia and Iran, have elections, but they're really not considered true democracies in that sense. They don't have what we would call uh, free and fair elections. Certain elements of participation, competition, or liberty are fundamentally broken under these countries or these states. These systems are sometimes referred to as illiberal or hybrid democracies, and some scholars call them 
uh, electoral democracies. Essentially, um, an electoral democracy would mean that they're holding elections um, and that's kind of all they do. It's just for the sake of holding elections. There's real no meaning or significance behind those elections because the results are sort of predetermined. They're predetermined outcomes. Um, on the flip side of that, the United States holds tons of elections throughout the year, especially when we consider how many elections there are at the state and local elect uh, levels. Um, some scholars have pointed out that the United States might have too many elections and that we have election burnout. Um, so those are sort of more liberal democracies. These uh, political systems are characterized by the promotion of participation, competition, liberty. Um, those are the things that emphasize individual rights and freedoms. When we're discussing democracies in the modern era, these are the countries we are referring to when we want to talk about um, what is a, a democracy, you know, the, the sort of elements that make up a democracy. And so at this point, I really want all of you to be thinking of countries that would fit into either of these categories. India, um, just on its sheer population uh, basis, is the largest uh, what we would consider democracy in the entire world. Okay, um, let's go through a history with um, highlighting Greece and Rome here. Ancient Greece and Athens, small community of direct democracy with few fixed institutions. So rather than evolving in a direct line from ancient Greece, specifically with the city state of Athens, democratic government has risen and fallen over centuries. And over time, it's taken a lot of different forms. One subvariant of ind indirect democracy, which had its origins in the Roman Republic, is republicanism, small, lowercase r. That's the representative democracy. Not talking about republicanism in the sense of a political conservative like uh, Marco Rubio or George W. Bush. Um, this is a very uh, uh, sort of republicanism is emphasizing the separation of powers within a state and the representation of the public through elected officials. Okay, um, this is uh, something to, to kind of focus on here, two forms of democracy. Ancient Greece and Athens practiced this form of democracy while Rome used indirect democracy. With some exceptions like referendums, which I've mentioned earlier, most modern democracy is governed using the indirect democracy form. If you really kind of think to back uh, to the early years of the Republic in the mid 1600s, late 1600s, early 1700s, moving into, into that time period, we see a lot of uh, New England town hall meetings. Um, these are forms of direct democracy where you get people together in a, in a public space in a town hall meetings and you have people you know, voicing their opinions about certain projects and things that are going on in the community. That gets really messy when you have a larger, when, when cities are sort of being built up. You can't, you can have certain elements of direct democracy in New York City or Chicago, the third largest city in the US uh, with 3.1 or 3.2 million people but you can see how that gets very messy when you have when you're trying to give a voice to a large urban area such as Chicago or New York City. Um, that becomes more challenging as a city grows, and so these these New England town halls really kind of work well for small northeast um, towns that are up in Maine and in Massachusetts, et cetera, when those places were first coming into existence. And so the modern era of democracy begins with the United Kingdom's slow transition to democracy. This evolution began with the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215. By limiting the power of the monarch 
and ensuring certain rights to the aristocracy, it had really had the effect of laying the groundwork for limited government. Due process before the law, one of the earliest civil liberties. Um, and that's, you know, due process includes a lot of different things, but mostly uh, what we're referring to here um, under due process in the American context is that you are essentially innocent until proven guilty. The prosecution has the burden of proof to bring uh, to the court to show uh, with evidence and facts that a particular person committed a crime. It's a heavy burden. We want that bar to be very high because we want to be sure that the person we are accusing of committing a crime actually committed the crime and it wasn't somebody else because there are mistakes that are made in a court of law. That's just to highlight one aspect of due process. Um, we also have legislative rule, so voting on bills, etc. The full title of the document is Magna Carta Libertarian, and this translates to the Great Charter of Freedoms and was essentially a peace treaty signed by King John of England and the barons that had challenged his power. King John wound up dying the following year, and then his son began uh, revoking some of the key elements of the Magna Carta. Even though this document itself may not have, been, uh, have lasted, the ideas behind it would have a lasting impact on the path toward democracy in the United Kingdom and its former colonies. So, at, for instance, the American Revolution was really inspired by many of its principles and then ultimately, our own American Constitution drew heavily from these ideas of the Magna Carta. And you can see it's a very old document at 1215 uh, when it came to, into existence. So these are just some of the various uh, explanations um, yeah, for why we have democratization. Um, and so let's just kind of go through them very quickly here. We have modernization. Um, as technology and things sort of um, increase, um, we are making our, our lives easier. Um, democracies seem to be kind of the way to go. Um, elites certainly want to have power. There is a power struggle. Civil society. Uh, civil society can be a lot of things like interest groups. Um, if you're, and these interest groups take on all shapes and sizes. And so generally these interest groups in civil society um, and organizations that sort of um, might have the effect of promoting the public good, we can say, um, are things that, um, you know, they're single issue. They really crank down the microscope on what citizens are engaged in and focused on and passionate about. So I'll, I'll give an example to be even handed on the left and the right. Um, if we take, for example, a, a more uh, left-leaning um, interest group, we might say that it's uh, something akin to Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace is an environmental group that uh, advocates for conservation efforts and preservation. Um, if we look at the National Rifle Association, that is uh, an interest group that is on the right that is very much um, involved in the Second Amendment. International relations. Um, democracy works can work um, very well when we are dealing with other countries and trying to get across certain points, particularly with diplomacy, um, trying to convince and be persuasive under a democracy, uh, there are certain areas of legitimacy that take place. There's actually a thing called the democratic peace theory, which um, states that democracies don't go to war with one another. And finally, we have political culture. Okay, so um, our modernization scholars, they are really kind of emphasizing that the societal transformations that coincide with economic modernization led to a country's population to put more pressure on the government to reform and to adopt to liberal democratic governance. I'm not meaning liberal like left-leaning in the sense of a Democrat like Hillary Clinton or 
um, trying to think of, you know, Joe Biden, some, I'm not, I'm thinking of that term as a lowercase L, a liberal democratic governance. Um, many current democracies are listed among the world's wealthiest countries and many wealthy countries such as the United States, the UK and Germany are also democratic. Post-World War II with the Marshall Plan, um, the United States, you know, invested heavily in Germany after it had been kind of carpet bombed. Uh, Dresden was firebombed. The, the country was in ruins post-World War II. The Marshall Plan helped with that, but it also um, brought in a lot of uh, people with knowledge about how to build Germany back up politically. Um, and essentially, the United States helped to write the constitution for both Germany and Japan. Um, now, this when we're when we're talking about this um, this theory, right? It's um, when we're evaluating the evidence for the theory of democracy. It's fallen out of favor since the nineteen seventies, in part due to empirical evidence. India is a good example of democracy that emerged prior to modernization, modernization theory, that is. This is what we're talking about. And other countries, China most recently, have shown that modernization is possible without democratization, right? China, meaning that China has a communist government politically, but they're very capitalistic in their economy. Other examples of countries that have modernized without becoming democracies include Latin American states through the 1980s. Though many of them are now democracies, several East Asian states like Malaysia and Singapore, and many Middle Eastern and West African states that have become wealthier by selling oil and other natural resources. So it's really dependent on sort of uh, your state capacity, if you will. Um, at times that can have a huge effect on where you want to move politically and you know being able to modernize quickly um has a lot it's 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 anchored in a country's history and how they uh really how they develop um and each each one is very unique so considering that recent work has been linked uh or linked democratization to growth it's possible that the causal argument is reversed in modernization theory. That is to say, democratization may have led to greater wealth. Um, a second economic argument here, and one that's generally preferred over modernization theory for most democracy scholars. Elites are just, are not just a country's formal leaders, they also include wealthy individuals who benefit from a non-democratic regime and they help to fund it. So this could be an oligarchy um, of people who are very deeply invested in certain natural resources of a country. Russia is a prime example of this, having a lot of elites um, that are uh, helping to fund it and that are friends of a non-democratic regime uh, under Putin. If they see that they're these elites, if they're, you know, just as well off or better off under democracy, they will support a change. Elites are not always resistant to democracy. In fact, they might well support it under certain conditions that give the elites feelings of security. The democratic tr transition could be negotiated in a way where elites kind of give up a little bit of political power, but their wealth is protected by the new government. You know, we can see this in the democratic transitions of South Africa and Chile. Um, elites might also support democracy if it grants them international support and or governing legitimacy from key allies, such as Taiwan. We can see that playing out as well. Okay. Next, we're moving on to kind of uh, civil society. Um, the main thrust of, of this idea here is that the public will be better able to push for reform if civil society is strong. And these are things that 
you know, the democracy should be doing, right? You know, it, it's civil society is all about organizations that are not part of the state. They're single issue oftentimes. Um, and they, they are made up with members who might, you know, donate money to the cause. They're, they're, these are powerful entities. Um, so it could be a bowling club, a religious institution, a labor union, or any kind of community organization. Non-democratic governments are aware of the risks of these emergency civil societies, and democracy promoters often celebrate the power of civil society when it's ultimately unleashed. So the world wound up watching as civil society groups uh, led to the end of communism in the late 80s leading to democracy in Eastern Europe, especially with some of those um, states like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And then again in the early 2010s as protests emerged across the Arab world, resulting in Tunisia's democratic transition. Keep in mind, those other countries in the Middle East and going uh, further to, into Eastern Europe were very well aware of this. And, and by the way, scared, fearful, that these uh, uprisings and color revolutions were going to be coming to a neighborhood near them, particularly with Syria. So you have rebel groups that are fighting there against Bashir al-Assad. Putin was, was very you know, concerned about this color revolution. They had one in Ukraine that um, tried to get rid of some of the corrupt elements of the, the Kyiv government at that particular time, Orange Revolution. Non-democratic leaders will sometimes take an active role in trying to limit or capture civil society as a way of preventing such challenges to their authority. They don't want any of that. They want to squash it as fast as they can. Mubarak was in power, I think, for 34 or 35 years, and he lost power in Egypt um, due to the Arab Spring. Many of these Arab leaders that had been um, strong men had fallen due to these uprisings. And it was all coordinated by people on Facebook. Facebook was a, a very powerful tool in this, um, in this Arab Spring in 2010 to 2011. And so China, we can highlight another example. They limit the activities of environmental or religious groups, even when they are not explicitly political. All right, let's move on. Um, the impact of international actors depends on a number of factors, including how they are connected to a country um, and its outside world. International actors have little influence on North Korea, for instance, because of its international isolation. There's very little that's known about it. What the outside world knows of North Korea, North Korea has um, the ability to control and shape the um sort of uh, the, the vision of what people are seeing, right? Um, and that makes it very isolated, very, it's an unknown, right? It's mysterious. People want to go there and find out. And uh, when they attempt to, then when they break their very strict laws, um, which they have in place for, for their own reasons, um, there are some, some really bad consequences that, that take place there. Um, but, you know, China has a vast size of economic resources, and it can limit the effectiveness of international actors. That's in stark contrast to North Korea. But China also exerts, a, they have a huge, you know, they can leverage things against North Korea because um, where is North Korea? Get, they, they don't create a lot of things. There's not a lot of manufacturing there. Uh, they don't grow a lot of food. And so imported from China. And so China has a huge um, advantage there in that in terms of being able to kind of control and, and um, leverage North Korea in a way that uh, they want to, they want to have control over them. Uh, roughly, I've seen the figures, it's uh, roughly 80% of, um, of trade is, is done between China and North Korea. I mean, meaning that 80% of what North Korea gets in the, on imports it's coming in from China. I suspect that the remaining 19 or 20 percent is probably coming in from Russia. Um, so states are not the only ones who want to promote democracy in some instances. One international 
um, non-governmental organization, NGO, that actively promotes pro-democracy revolutions is, Bel is a Belgrade-based canvas. It's founded by protesters, many of whom are college students, who successfully overthrew uh, Serbia's Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic died over in The Hague, by the way, um, at, at an international uh, criminal tribunal. But let's get back to this group. They helped to train the Tunisian and Egyptian protesters beginning in 2009 and ramping up to 2010. Their training had a massive influence on the tactics that they employed by these local groups during the Arab Spring. So while Egypt ultimately returned to a non-democracy, Tunisia remains as one of the only democracies in the Arab world. Uh, democracies can also, you know, kind of help to um, support things like tourism. If a country is deemed to or seen as safe, a safe place to travel to, a lot of people are going to go there. Uh, Morocco is a shining example of this. They have Morocco and Ghana have really ramped up tourism over the years because they've um, been able to put into place a security apparatus that really allows uh, foreigners from other countries around the world to say, you know what, this is a, a place that's worth going to and seeing. And if you have a, you know, a, a place that's very unstable and is risky, like Somalia, you have piracy, it's not seen as a place where uh, a lot of people are able to travel to just given the security dilemma of that particular country. So, um, Many people used to argue that democracy required Western values to function properly. And so while you often hear these arguments in the press or among Western politicians, many modern political scientists really feel uncomfortable with these arguments. And I've kind of put out um, the, on this slide here for those who argue yes and those who argue no, under whether or not democracy is a product of Western culture. Um, it's democracy, we can say, is spread to many countries around the world, and each major global region has at least one democracy. Japan and South Korea are famous examples of non-Western democracies, as in Tunisia, an Islamic Arab democracy. And so you might want to think of others. Um, maybe you could look at the freedom House's map of freedom, and uh, you can, you know, certainly pick out new examples from that. But most political scientists today argue that there are no democratic or undemocratic cultures, that instead culture shapes the form of democracy a country decides to adopt when it makes that transition. Individualism is seen as a, particular we a particularly Western value and it may push countries to prioritize the freedom and competition uh, aspects of democracy. Societies whose cultures prioritize the community may instead build democracies, emphasizing the equality and consensus building aspects of democracy. And so it's really up to these states to decide in their own, their own vision, in their own eyes, to uh, create a democracy of their choosing. Um, there are so many different, different ways of going about doing this. But, you know, when we look at globalization, um, there was a very interesting study done um, just sort of looking at McDonald's and how that's exploited and spread, right? So is democracy a globalization aspect? Um, I don't know, but, you know, sort of McDonald's uh, restaurants are, are everywhere around the world, uh, with the exception of probably a few states. But this study recognized that, you know, it, it looked at a survey across the world, and it found that the golden arches were more, you know, sort of, when people saw the golden arches of McDonald's, they recognized that to hamburgers more than they did the Holy Cross to Christianity. Um, you have other 
you know, multinational corporations such as Coca-Cola that have spread into, um, you know, virtually every state around the world. So those are those are also interesting kind of things at the backdrop of democracy spreading across the world. You also might want to consider sort of globalization efforts and um, how that uh, plays a role. OK, so. What explains democratization in Asia? Let's dig into that a little bit. Um, we have a photo here of workers that are assembling computer components in Taipei, Taiwan. Now, these computer components are super important. Semiconductors, you may have heard of them in the news. There's a massive shortage or was. And uh, these, uh, these chips, um, the United States has passed a CHIPS Act where they are attempting to have this, this type of manufacture. And Taiwan Semiconductors, uh, they're a massive company. Um, and they provide these chips, which are found in our cell phones, our computers, our cars, like all the connected devices, the Internet of Things, IoT. All of those things have these chips that are really critical for running the components of, uh, of your Amazon Alexa, Again, your car, Bluetooth, all the connected devices that you can think of need these semiconductors. And these chips are, are they're, they're really expensive and they're only manufactured in a few countries. And so when we had uh, supply chain issues, it became a big problem for us, especially with cars and the auto industry. And so um, the last three decades have uh, really... Well, let me let me actually back up here for just a second and look at three types of executive designs. We've got the parliamentary systems under the UK, presidential system, that would be in the United States, and a semi-presidential system. Uh, our example there is France. So um, we, we do want to get into um, a discussion of executive designs, but prior to doing that, let me just go back to this slide for just one second. And um, and it's, I, I wanna talk about democratization in, ta in Taiwan, South Korea, and the Philippines. Even though the, the Philippines lately has been seen as backsliding in recent years, um, they have uh, Marcos, uh, Ferdinand Marcos' son, Bomba, is now in, back in the presidency. Anyways, uh, Duarte was a kind of a ruled with an iron fist in the Philippines. This is from very fascinating things happening in that country in particular. But the major explanations for these democratization gains are economic modernization, which is leading to a better educated and more politically aware middle class population that are willing to change traditional authority. Secondly, active civil society engagement, pushing for democratic reforms. Third, low levels of inequality are coinciding with elites who are less, feel less threatened by democracy. And they're, so they're, therefore they're sort of willing to um, institute reforms. And lastly, international pressures from the United States and international non-governmental organizations, NGOs, are supporting civil society and pushing for democratic reforms. Big outlier in this region is China, which by some indicators seems to be primed for democratization. The Chinese government has resisted such efforts so far, especially with uh, the Xi Jinping uh, administration. But growing inequality and the increasing concentration of wealth in the hands of party elites means that they have a strong incentive to stay in power. Um, and that's already been evidenced by the 1989 crackdown, Tiananmen Square is what I'm referring to. Okay, so now I can sort of get into this. Um, what I wanna say here is the most common executive um, sort of systems in democracies are parliamentary systems. The United States, UK, Canada, Germany, South Korea, and Japan are only a few countries that are operating under this system. Okay, so 
before I, I dive into the parliamentary systems, um, I want to go ahead and this is a good stopping point for us, I think. And we can catch the second half of the lecture. Please stay tuned for that.